All right, we're going to get started. So today we're going to be talking about systemic neural adaptation and our product, which is called NeuroSage. So a little background about me. My name is Dr. Kyle Daigle. Um, I actually am a former college athlete. I played baseball at McNeese State University, uh, transferred, went to LSU, was pursuing a biological science degree. While at LSU, I was um, interested in oncology, so I went to Pennington Biomedical Research Center and was a student research assistant there. And then after that, I was actually at LSU's vet school, did some research there before actually going to chiropractic school in Parker, which is in Dallas, Texas. And at Parker, I was the uh, nutrition club president for two years. And then um, after that, I decided to open up a private practice called Ultimate Performance Cairo and Rehab in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And then I've consistently pursued uh, further education in neurology, actually a thing called functional neurology, which is kind of a subset of neurological rehabilitation. Um, and I've done that through National University of Health and Sciences. Um, I'm a current member of the International Association of Functional Neurology and Rehabilitation. And then I do have a 100-hour certification within that. And then I am the co-inventor of NeuroSage, which is the product we're going to talk about today, and the medical director for SNA Biotech. So let's talk about this. Our traditional approach when we're working with neurological conditions or pretty much just really any kind of condition is, is you know, we do go after, you know, go to our doctor or prescribed, you know, certain medications. Um, if we do have any sort of uh, orthopedic condition or maybe a musculoskeletal or neurological disorder, you know, we're given a script and then we go to, you know, um, some sort of rehabilitation program. And in the top right corner, I want you to see this is that I have here is a nurse and she's working with a uh, geriatric patient doing curls. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this because when I do go into nursing home facilities, I do a little consulting work. And one of the things that I do is kind of evaluate rehabilitation programs and then see if we can help improve outcomes. And one of the things I want you to see in here is, you know, this, this elderly lady is doing bicep curls and, um, you know, bicep curls are activating a flexor muscle. And if this lady has balance issues, in my opinion, I think we'd want to be activating extensors. And then if you look at her eyes, um, maybe something that she could actually do while she's doing exercises, we can actually have her either fixate at a target, maybe even do some uh, vertical eye movements. Uh, so that's kind of the, you know, the talk today is just going to be kind of teaching you how we can possibly use an additional approach. So what if we can optimize outcomes with digital intervention? And that's what we, you know, our main focus with our software companies at. So this guy right here is using virtual reality. Uh, virtual reality is kind of becoming a new thing in rehab. There's a difference between virtual reality and then augmented reality. Uh, this right here is considered virtual, so he's virtually immersed in the basically a virtual world. And then you have augmented reality, which actually projects holograms out in the environment. So virtual reality, you know, there's a risk of people getting cyber sickness. You know, a lot of patients with uh, very sensitive vestibular disorders, certain eye movements, um, even patients with anxiety may not situate too well using virtual reality, but augmented reality which is a little bit less strenuous on the eyes and, and what doesn't make you feel so claustrophobic. So um, this is what we're all about right here is trying to use some sort of digital intervention to try and help optimizing outcomes. So uh, our product name is called NeuroSage. Um, and, you know, we do have different types. We have a therapy. Uh, therapy is more so like video files. We have uh, interactive games. We have a library section that could actually... Um, talk a little bit more and kind of educate you about the vestibular system, about eye movements. Uh, you know, there's even certain acupressure points that we've uh, found that work great in certain conditions. Uh, there's also other additional sensory stimulations like vibration therapy uh, that you may use. Uh, you know, we use a company called Viplate. It's a product that, you know, does a lot of appropriate set of input. We found that there's certain frequencies that you can use that can actually do different things. For example, reducing pain or possibly even enhancing cognitive function. All right, so SNA Biotech, we are a software company that assists in accelerating recovery times from injuries and improving balance and coordination issues. 
So if you look at this, um, you'll see we have a television monitor, we have a headset, we have Viplate, these are the platforms that I was talking about, and then we have screens, you know, this is a video file that we found, but we also have an Xbox controller that uses, um, you know, you a lot of dexterity to try to help coordinate some of these games. All right, systemic neural adaptation, what is it? So the process of SNA is the intentional change over time of bodily systems to carefully modulate it and applied visual, auditory, and physical stimulus. This systemic change through neural response enables the brain and body to work in harmony to increase both physical and mental performance. Targeted visual and auditory stimulus are introduced via a wireless headset and a television monitor. A healthy sensory system is essential to healthy brain development because it is a solo driver of stimulation to the brain. With this understanding of this, we develop NeuroSage to accommodate the sensory stimulation while therapists and doctors administer their regular therapy or treatment regimens. So here's a video game. This is called Speed Racer. Um, and the object of this is, is that you actually control this little spaceship as you go through this tunnel. And what you have to do is, is collect certain balls while you avoid obstacles. So what we do is, is we have a point system. We also have a time and um, we also have lives right here. So um, this game has worked very, very phenomenal with movement disorders. It's worked great with kids with ADHD and autism. Um, it's also worked great with Asperger kids. This game also has worked great for an assisting and balancing coordination issues as well. And so how would we use this? So let's say that a patient had a stroke, had some sort of um, hand contractor. Well, what the patient could actually do is, is the patient can actually play the video game if they can open up their you know, right hand, if their left hand was affected, or a therapist or a family member can play the video game and the patient actually keeps their eyes fixated on a target while they're traveling through. And then what happens is the therapist can either do manual therapy and they can actually try maybe... Um, do some form of like active release or, or massage or vibration massage on the left hand while the patient's actually playing the video game. And it can help out significantly when improving range of motion and coordination of that affected limb. So here's a case that I want to show you of a spinal cord injury patient that walked into our office. So as you can see, I mean, there was a pretty significant herniate disc into the spinal cord. So this guy right here, um, He's trying to throw a ball, and you can see him. His balance is a little off. So, you know, we'll have him do it again here. He'll throw this ball. So you can see that, you know, his posterior, basically his his posture muscles weren't stabilized. So here's a game that we have. It's called Brick Breaker. The patient actually has headphones on, and um, he's actually controlling the game. So the object of this is to take this little ball and to try and knock off all these blocks. So we have a lot of vertical, horizontal eye movements. Um, you know, we have found that we can utilize specific colors to do different things with certain muscles. So, um, you know, he's, there's a vibrate, you know, his feet are actually being vibrated right now at a certain frequency. And uh, we had some head rotations activate his vestibular system. And then he tries and throw, and you see his balance is a whole lot better. And, you know, he also acknowledges that his balance is better. So we actually waited, and you're going to see here, and I, and I mentioned this, we waited an hour before we went ahead and, and reposted this. And it still held. So again, just utilizing rehabilitation, trying to improve someone's balance and coordination, we used a, a video game that we developed. <clears throat> here is a uh, patient that I've worked on. He had a traumatic brain injury. And whenever he walked in the office, we actually had, you know, absolutely no patella reflexes bilaterally. And I'm going to go ahead and just take a reflex hammer and we're going to go ahead and try and check this out. Okay, so very, very minimal, if not absent reflex on the left. Then we're going to activate the right patella reflex, you know, plus one. And then we actually did a neurosage session. And I'm going to go ahead and check him out again. We're going to see what happened. And we're going to get a plus two reflex. Same day. 
actually induce an open reflex. Uh, patella on the left side, got a little bit. Still got to get this thing going back. And then bring your radialis, everything's good. But again, we had a... And we have a cervical dystonia case here. So I'm just doing a classic finger to nose test here. Um, this finger right here, and I want you to touch the tip of your nose. So you can see here that she has quite a bit of dysfunction trying to perform this simple task. And then she, you'll hear here, but she talks about how it's pretty fatiguing. Wears me out. Uh, it just makes me shake. Like, I, I shake so bad inside. It's not even funny. Well, well I want you, to, my goal is to try to see when we finished our treatment today to make that where it's going to be smoother and okay. more coordinated. Okay. All right, now let's go back up. Let's just leave that arm right there. Let's just do it this arm. Let's put this arm straight out. Okay, now take this finger and touch the tip of your nose. You got it. Good, good. Let's lift our arms up. Let's take our left finger, touch the tip of our nose. Good, back out. Take our right finger to the tip of our nose. Good. And back out. Now, would you do me a favor? You put our arms down. Will you tell me how many sessions that we've already had? As far as? No, just that you came in. When did you come in? This is our first session. Good. All right. <clears throat> so how are we able to achieve that? And it's through sensory stimulation. Uh, so through carefully select and applied visual and auditory stimulation, along with prescribed therapy, we can increase recovery times, reduce acute and chronic pain injuries, improve balance and coordination, as well as cognitive function. So um, we extend, still recommend you know, traditional rehabilitation programs. What we've done differently is that we've added an acoustic intervention, and we've also added visual stimulation in conjunction with our rehabilitation program. So main focus areas, balance and coordination, pain management, cognition, so systemic neural adaptation in conjunction with current therapy protocols can accelerate and optimize patient outcomes, and just as what you saw. So my clinical practice, my main patients are typically chronic pain patients. I work with a lot of neurological disorders, for example, Parkinson's patients, traumatic brain injuries, sensory disorders, involuntary movements, balance and coordination, stroke patients professional athletes that are looking at performance enhancement measurements, and then post-surgical rehab. So restoring balance. Balance is something that um, I feel that majority of people have an issue with. I even work with Olympic athletes and find out they even still have you know minor balance issues that if we can improve those, we get better outcomes. So in order to restore balance, it needs three basically inputs. So you're going to get inputs from the vestibular system, which I'm going to go on here in a second and explain a little bit about that. Sight and proprioception. So these three sensory stimulations fire into an area in the brain called the cerebellum, which coordinates and regulates posture, movement, and balance. And then from that, the brainstem integrates and sorts out information. And then from that, you actually are going to get motor impulses to control eye movements, which assist in balance. And then the brainstem, as well as the cerebellum, also help out with motor impulses to make postural adjustments. So the case earlier you seen with the uh, um, spinal cord patient, you know, he was able to significantly have better balance following vestibular, basically, head positions. So he was had him tilting his head left and right, and then he was playing a video game, and then we were using vibration over his feet. Um, so the baseline level of brain activity comes mainly from constant inflow of input from gravity. This comes from input from postural muscles and other tendon joint receptors. 
So up here is a great thing to look at is intrinsic muscles that are activated by the vestibulospinal tract. So the vestibular system is one of the main systems that help orient individuals with themselves. It helps maintain proper posture and balance. So if you go to a nursing home, how many patients do you see have balance issues? Pretty much the majority of all of them. And then what's actually happening to their posture and you see that we have a physical alteration. So in my opinion, I think that if we can catch this stuff earlier on, we can improve someone's posture or improve someone's balance and it can work both ways. So eye movements can help improve postural muscle and tone and improving cognitive and coordination functions. So over here, we're looking at the different cranial nerves in the eye and how they fire into the vestibular system. And then we actually have the vestibulo and how these things actually fire into the vestibular nuclei. And then what happens with eye movements and even vestibular activation, that this thing also can help out with controlling our posture. So in our clinic, if you look here at the eye and you see where all these nerves basically fire into the brainstem and the pons, that maybe you may can actually do vertical eye movements before you do sit to stand and help, you know, a geriatric patient, you know, have better coordination or even increase their speed of a sit to stand uh, instead of looking down on the floor. So uh, here's a great paper, a uh, great book. Uh, ocular motility of aging and dementia patients. So over here shows you all the different structures. So your brain stem, cerebral cortex, the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, and even the vestibular sensors. And then it shows what systems are involved. For example, fixation, vestibular ocular reflex, optokinetic, saccades, smooth pursuits, and you can actually see the systems. So what we actually did was just develop video games that could actually help with increase in stimulation to certain areas in the brain. So if I can increase certain areas of the brain by stimulation, we increase blood flow to that area, and then we can actually start strengthening these systems. Um, here's a great picture of an anterior head or forward head posture. So, for example, majority of our patients in the nursing home have a lot of cervical flexion. So let's look at this. You know, cervical flexion, basically, you're going to get decreased oxygen to the brain. So you're going to have less circulation, less oxygen capacity with restriction of thoracic cavity. So we start seeing that, you know, shallow breaths, they start getting rapid. Um, compression of cervical nerve roots, creating musculoskeletal issues. You know, a lot of our patients are having issues with weakness in their hands, uh, carpal tunnel, um, even even possibly even developing tremors based off of cervical compression of nerve roots. And then right here is the overactivation of the anterior canal in the vestibular system. So, you know, this patient, let's just say if this was a female and she goes and gets her hair done and she tilts her head back and then she comes up, she may actually possibly get maybe an onset of vertigo because there could be overactivation of the anterior canal. The anterior canal has actually been proven to where it helps activate flexor muscles. So we're starting to see a lot more patients flexor dominant, uh, which can create a lot of more, again, musculoskeletal pain. And then right here, you're seeing even physical alteration of posture, altering one's center of gravity. Um, right here is a great example to show, you know, I get a lot of patients that come and see me that have insomnia. And um, I talk to them about, you know, being very cautious on, you know, um, screen time too. And, you know, I do have a company that we do, you know, promote screen usage, but it's specific, you know. But let's look at this. So melatonin pathways can actually be stimulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So you basically have certain light waves activate the retina, turn around, go into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then when you look up here, we can actually see even melatonin. So your circadian rhythms are actually produced based off of visual light. Um, this is really interesting The that the uh, receptors are located in the retina. So you actually have what's called amacrine cells. Um, I was taking this thing and the references are all in the very back, but um, there's different type of receptors, GABA, glycine, glutamate, dopamine, acetylcholine. So GABA is a neurotransmitter that's an inhibitory. So let's say I have a patient who has anxiety, um, even possibly even movement disorders. For example, a little kid who maybe has pandas or even Parkinson's patients. So if we can be possibly stimulate GABA production through using specific visual stimulation, then we can help out reduce movement disorders. 
glycine. Uh, it's used two ways. One in the spinal cord. It's used to help out with alleviating pain or actually inhibiting pain in the spinal cord. And in the liver, it's used in phase two detoxification. Um, dopamine, looking at, you know, um, cognitive functions, muscle coordination, acetylcholine, looking at muscle activation. So uh, it's pretty neat. Maybe that, you know, it's stuff that we're working on, still trying to get more research out there, but just maybe possibly being able to use certain types of stimulus to try and help in improving some of these neurotransmitter outcomes. All right, acoustic and head movements. Uh, music may alter patterns of pain, reducing the perception of pain. Uh, now there's a lot of research out there and I'm just saying just generalize because we do use specific type of music therapy. And then head movements such as tilting and rotation can help stimulate the vestibular system for improving balance and coordination. So when you look here, we have the vestibulo here and then we have the cochlear here. So with this vestibular cochlear nerve, it fires in here to the brainstem. So we're looking at something here in the next slide. I'll show you guys about maybe possibly using music therapy and head positions as an additional component to your rehabilitation program. Here's the auditory pathway. So uh, hair cells in the cochlear, you look when it goes into the brainstem. Then actually we have a little ipsilateral up to the left side of the brain. And then we have a contralateral will go to the right side of the brain. So it's pretty neat because music can actually stimulate the brain. Uh, here's a paper that shows how muscles move better with rhythm. Uh, you know, a lot of my athletes love listening to music when they work out. I always ask them, you know, is there any difference? I just feel like they can actually have better endurance. So um, here was actually a study to show that, you know, rhythm and no rhythm, uh, but did show that there was rhythm with music. So I use patients who have um, stroke or any sort of gait issues. We may possibly you have used in the past like an interactive metronome, certain cadences as they try to walk to improve their coordination. Right now, some really interesting stuff. Uh, here is the ear, looking at the different anatomy of sensory nerves in the external ear. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So um, we, you know, use headphones. We don't use earbuds, but we use full headphones. But I feel personally that we can use certain acoustic frequencies to stimulate the surface area to help with improving vagal nerve outcomes. So um, I appreciate, you know, Ken Hub for letting me use this uh, slide here. But I just want to show you the irregular branch of the vagus nerve. And then let's look up here. So here we have the brain stem. And then we look out here. Here's the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve, and how it innervates all the organs. So let's say that I have a patient who has some sort of gastric issue, uh, maybe hypochlorhydria, um, even possibly even an H. pylori infection. You know, can you possibly use an acoustic intervention to try to help improving, you know, stomach outcomes or gastric outcomes? What about cardiac output? You know, I've, I've found that, you know, patients who have low blood pressure, we've been able to use certain sound waves to try and help out with improving that. Um, so, again, here's another thing just to kind of show you the irregular branch and the vagal nerve uh, connection. So, let's look up here in this, the vestibular pathways. So, over here we say the ocular motor centers. We actually have the semicircular canals and how both eye movements and these canals can actually fire down and have improvements on cervical muscles, even lower limb anti-gravity extensors. So if you're working on a patient who's got, you know, in a wheelchair, more likely probably have some sort of anterior head carriage. So their front canal may be overactivated and their sit to stands are a whole lot slower. So maybe you might want to do some sort of, you know, upward vertical eye movement to activate the posterior canal to try and help strengthen out the cervical posture muscles to then try to help out with activating the lower limb extensors. And now this patient's going to have better mobility. Um, so um, that's that. Again, here, the inner balance system, along with proprioception, basically spatial awareness and the oculomotor system make up the majority of all stimulus to the brain. The vestibular system work closely with the visual and auditory systems to help with spatial awareness and movement. So here we have the eye 
and here we have the semicircular canal and then we're showing on how we can literally use eye movements even vestibular activation to try and help out improving specific muscle outcomes um, so Here's a great article uh, just right here shows, this was the article, the title was called Saccades Improved Postural Control. Uh, so down here it says, this study shows the presence of an interaction between the ocular motor system and the postural system. Engaging in ocular tasks results in reduction of postural sway. Uh, science of optimization through sound therapy. Uh, just a great paper, just kind of talking about different things. Um, so I'll kind of leave you here for a second, but uh, how music impacts the brain just shows you corpus callosum, motor cortex, prefrontal cortex, nucleus accumbens, amygdala, sensory cortex, auditory cortex, visual cortex, and the cerebellum. You know, I love working on patients who have cerebellar issues. Um, so sound therapy can also help out with patients with, you know, a lot of different type of functions. You know, I always get asked all the time, you know, how safe is, you know, using NeuroSage or the application of systemic neural adaptation. And I found a great paper that just shows, um, you know, that it was concluded that the investigation of brain stimulation technique can apply to induce favorable measurements uh, to large treatments of cerebral disorders that affect humans in a safe and non-invasive way. It suggested that positive results can be found through the association of brain stimulation by light and sound with therapies that combat depression and anxiety states. So again, shows here that, you know, it was uh, safe and non-invasive. And <clears throat> here's another paper, the effect of tempo of music on heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. So again, I was kind of talking about the uh, vagal nerve interaction, but... You know, here's the abstract. There was a significant increase in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure of the subjects listening to fast music, while there was a statistically significant decrease in the mean of both systolic and diastolic blood pressure of the subjects on listening to slow music. Um, so music has also been found to have a positive effect on the intellectual and cognitive ability of individuals, possibly through different interconnected processes in the brain. Uh, a few studies found that patients suffering from anxiety, depression, pain, stress, and insomnia benefit the most from listening to classical music, as evidenced by a decrease in both heart rate and blood pressure. So over here, though, it did just say that a positive correlation could provide the grounds for use of music therapy in patients who suffer from anxiety or tension. And that right there is going to end the presentation. Just, um, you know, I think that you guys do a great job with rehabilitation. I just think that if you add some sort of additional, you know, uh, phototonic and acoustic stimulation in conjunction with your therapy, I think you can improve some of the outcomes. You know, NeuroSage it does great because it actually has harnessed a lot of the vestibular activation, a lot of appropriate set of activation, you know, engaging in specific eye movements. We've even used specific colors and um, even looking at certain types of uh, frequencies, acoustic frequencies to try and help out with improving different outcome measurements. Um, even possibly now kind of looking at doing uh, even improving organ functions. And that's some of the research that we're working on. You know, we do currently have uh, some research trials going on in a couple of academic universities. And then we just now kind of tapped into going abroad um, looking at doing different things with different countries and some of their, um, you know, uh, populations that patients really aren't getting better with some of the traditional outcomes. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and email me at kdagle at snabiotech.com. You can check our website out. And then my private practice website, um, I say website address is right here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Thank you.